here we go. So as I said, I'm so happy to be here. So happy to talk to and see everybody. My name is Noah Zazanis. I, this is my first time giving this presentation, but I've been involved in all of these struggles for probably at least a decade in some capacity, one of the other. Um, I started doing sex work decriminalization work and drug decriminalization work, which is most of the organizing I'm doing now about four, four or five years ago, um, shortly before the passage of SESTA-FOSTA, which was a very bad law that affected sex workers very negatively. And I'll talk about that a little in the presentation, but my current work now is with the Urban Survivors Union, which is an organization for people who use drugs. I'm in the Sex Workers Call, which is an intersectional call about the needs for people who trade sex or are trafficking survivors and who also use drugs. At the same time, I've worked for abortion access nonprofits. I used to work for the Guttmacher Institute. I did trans health research. I have a master's in epidemiology technically, and my research is on trans people's experiences of chronic pain. I'm trans myself drug user myself, a bunch of other things myself. Um, this is all really important to me and I'm excited to talk to you about it. So as some of you probably know, as probably a lot of you know, recently there was a leaked document that comes from the Supreme Court, comes from the desk of Samuel Alito showing plans to repeal the decision of Roe versus Wade. This would not immediately criminalize abortion in the US. It's important to say that, what it would do is leave it back up to the states like it was before Roe versus Wade was passed. This means, of course, that in a lot of red states, including Kentucky, abortion access is likely to be rolled back significantly. In the decision written by Alito, there was a section just stuck out to me from the beginning. This section said, these attempts to justify abortion through appeals to a broader right to autonomy and to define one's concept of existence prove too much. These criteria at a high level of generality could license fundamental rights to illicit drug use, prostitution, and the like. It's dark, it's depressing. And at the same time, I'm like, yes, absolutely. You know, We do believe in bodily autonomy. We do believe that people should not be criminalized for what they do with their bodies and what they do to survive. And that's really my starting point with this presentation and everything I say is gonna be guided by those principles. With regard to abortion in particular, Roe versus Wade is still the law of the land currently. The draft document hasn't been released, but already with current laws, there's many areas in the country where it's difficult to get an abortion. In order to get a clinic abortion, you know, where you go to a doctor, you can take a medication or experience a surgery and get abortion that way. In some areas, it's over 200 miles, 100 miles. Lots of difficulties of access just by driving. And additionally, you know, there are waiting periods, parental consent laws, all sorts of laws that have been put up in order to restrict access to legal abortion without necessarily repealing Roe versus Wade. Sorry, I'm going back and forth. Um, as we can see here, though, you know, if Roe is overturned, there's going to be far more abortion deserts, far more difficulties in access, far more areas where the nearest abortion clinic isn't within 100 or 200 miles. Going to be much harder for people to access, but still an extent of criminalization will vary throughout the country. And in a lot of places, it will be similar to how it is now with access being impossible or difficult already. This is why it's important to look at what people are already doing to guarantee abortion access in areas where abortion is difficult to receive. Organizations like Plan C and like Women Help Women help pregnant people access two medications, misoprostol or mifepristone, in order to do self-managed abortion. A self-managed abortion is any abortion that happens outside of the care of a provider, either through telemedicine or through an in-person in a clinic. There are lots of organizations, lots of people who help people self-manage their abortions, and self-managed abortion is medically safe as much as you know any medication, any procedure has risks, but overall very safe. The problem is criminalization. When people are criminalized for medical abortions, they aren't allowed to just you know, go to a hospital if they experience complications, receive health care, have supervision from a doctor because they can face you know, punishment under the law under, what is it, what's the word? Fetal endangerment, I believe it's called, it's a different name somewhere else, but these are all laws which were eventually, originally for 
protection of intimate partner survivors whose fetuses were endangered by violence, but are now being used against people who are suspected of self-inducing a pregnancy, which can't be medically determined, so often people who miscarry are targeted as well. The reason I bring this up is because the overlap of healthcare and criminalization is a major theme throughout all of the topics I'm talking about today. I have some examples of this on the slide. One particular unfortunate timely one is the Texas administrative decision, which was saying that medical transition would be considered child abuse under the law. What this means is that in any healthcare setting, child abuse mandatory reporters would technically be required to report parents for abusing their children if children are medically transitioning at all. The reason I say technically required is because, as always, mandatory laws are enforced unevenly. There's a lot of power in being a medical professional, and some of these medical professionals are making choices to either resist these laws or to enforce them. You know, there's always degrees of enforcement. That being said, though, we've already seen examples in you know child psychiatric hospitals in Texas where trans youth dealing with mental illness, dealing with suicide, have been reported to the authorities as potential child abuse victims. This example of child protection, of the protection of vulnerable people being weaponized to carceral ends is also very obvious when we talk about anti-trafficking screenings. Lots of organizations, both nonprofits and government organizations like ICE and the Department of Defense, have started working with healthcare providers, even with hotels, with schools, to try to give advice on how to identify trafficking survivors. Their definition of who's a trafficking survivor, though, is very vague. It includes basically anyone who's trading sex, even if they're doing so as a consensual adult. It can also include anyone who, you know, they think have bruises they shouldn't have. Anyone who, you know, if one partner speaks better English than the other partner and it seems like they're controlling, that can be a red flag. It's used disproportionately against sex workers, but also used disproportionately against any kind of couple that doesn't fit these norms of acceptability or any individual person that doesn't meet respectability norms. What this means for sex workers is that if you go to a doctor for reproductive health care, for sexual health, or for anything, you have to hide the fact that you sell sex. You have to hide your job. You have to hide anything that might make them report you because you have to worry about being arrested, quote unquote, for your own good. These laws do end up arresting and targeting sex workers, even if they say that they're only targeting people who are promoting or advertising or, quote unquote, pimping. Slightly different, but same general concept is what happens at methadone clinics for people who are dependent on opioids and who are receiving medication assistant therapy. In the same way, these laws, which are supposedly attempt, attempts to protect people by preventing diversion, by making sure that people who are prescribed methadone get to use their methadone, just end up very making it very hard to even access methadone at all. Often these clinics will make it so you have to come in at eight or nine in the morning, I personally could not leave my house and get to a doctor reliably every single day at eight or nine in the morning. I just couldn't do it. I certainly couldn't do it if I was working a job that required me to work at night, whether that's driving an Uber, making food, selling sex, or if I had kids to take care of at home, anything like that, it would be incredibly difficult to get there in the morning, talk to my mandatory counselor, fill out all the paperwork and have to take my methadone right there. Over the COVID-19 pandemic, because of the viral risks of having to go in person, some states have made much more lax methadone policies. So people have been able to take their methadone home. And this has been really good for relapse prevention, for keeping people from having to use drugs on the street, preventing fentanyl poisonings, preventing overdoses. At the same time, a lot of these laws are being rolled back because the DEA is tightening restrictions again, because clinics have changed their individual policies various reasons. And that, once again, makes it harder for people to receive the health care they need and makes it harder for them to proceed in their recovery or in reducing harms of opioid use. I realize that I never finished this slide, so I'm just going to wing it. Sorry about that. Sex work is an umbrella term referring to dot, dot, dot. It's referring to a lot of things. It's referring to what's considered under the law of prostitution, having sex for money. It also refers to stripping, exotic dancing. It also refers to any kind of fetish work, pro-doming, pro-subbing, rope tying. It refers to selling sex on the internet through you know, OnlyFans, through selling videos, through porn performances. It refers to, what else? Um, phone sex, all kinds of things. It's a really wide umbrella term used to refer to an industry. Only some forms of sex works are, are criminalized Again, usually full service sex work or what the law would call prostitution is criminalized under these laws. 
In sex worker advocate circles, sex work decriminalization repeals to refers to repealing all the laws criminalizing the selling or purchasing of sex by consenting adults. I'm laying that out here on purpose because decriminalization means a lot of different things to different people and it has a very specific meaning within the sex work decrim movement. Two examples of things that are not sex work decriminalization are sex work legalization and partial criminalization. Sex work legalization is a regulated sex trade, usually a dot, 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 something like a brothel model like it exists in Nevada, anything where there's a red light district, which is specifically where people are sell, able to sell sex, anything where people need to have a license or testing in order to have, in order to sell sex. Any situation like that will make an underclass of people who are still selling sex because they have to or because they want to, but don't have the right employer, right paperwork, et cetera, until there's still a class of people, mostly less privileged sex workers, immigrants, people of color who are criminalized. Partial criminalization is the work, the term used in the sex workers' rights movement to refer to a model of legislation which is used in Norway, Sweden. It's called the Nordic model for that reason. Sometimes organizations that support it also call it the equality or end demand model. This model claims that they're going to decriminalize sex work while at the same time criminalizing people who buy sex. They usually also criminalize promoting or facilitating sex work in any way. This is still a problem for sex workers because for so many reasons. One of them is that if you make it that facilitating sex work is still a crime, if you make it that people are categorized as pimps for driving someone to their job, for being in the other room to help keep someone safe, you're getting in the way of harm reduction. You're getting in the way of the work that sex workers do to protect each other. Also, you're making it so that civilians, people who don't sell sex, are in danger of being associated with sex workers, and that also puts sex workers at risk. There have been examples in Nordic countries of sex workers being evicted because their landlords got noticed that they were quote unquote facilitating prostitution and therefore had to like had to vacate sex workers from the premise or chose to in order to avoid legal consequences. This makes it illegal to provide sex workers with housing. It often makes it illegal for family members of sex workers because they're considered to be living off the proceeds of sex work, which is also legal under these laws. Also, just the aspect that's aimed in criminalizing clients still creates issues for sex workers because clients are less likely to be willing to go through safety measures. It's harder to get someone to screen. It's harder to compare someone to a blacklist and say, oh, this person's not been reported as doing anything unsafe or violent in the past if clients have to worry about being criminalized. For this reason, sex workers' rights movement is really adamant about full decriminalization. I bring all that up because there was a new proposed abortion ban coming from the National Right to Life Coalition, which is the right-wing organization that proposes a lot of laws, which then Republicans will put forward in you know, various state legislation, various state legislative bodies. This one specifically is a part of one of the laws proposed that specifically banned conspiring to cause or aid in abetting illegal abortions. Like the Nordic model, this law says it's going to criminalize everybody except the pregnant person. The law says except the pregnant woman, you know, who conspires to cause an illegal abortion or who aids and abets an illegal abortion. This would make it illegal to do the harm reduction work I discussed earlier of helping people find mifepristone, misoprostol, being an abortion doula, helping someone go to the hospital and report complications. Anything like that that made it easier to have an abortion could be criminalized. This is very similar to the Nordic model's treatment of sex workers because it makes sex work or makes abortion more dangerous by making it harder to facilitate it because they think it's wrong. I specifically mention here another piece of legislation which has already passed in the US, which is, as I mentioned, SESTA-FOSTA. SESTA stands for the Stop Online Sex Trafficking Act or Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act, rather, and FOSTA says something similar, Online Sex Trafficking Act. This was legislation which was passed in 2018, which made it so that web hosts were cr criminally or legally liable for any content which facilitated sex trafficking. In practice, it made them liable for any content facilitating any kind of sex work, including consensual sex work that happened in real life and was legally considered prostitution. It also made it even harder for people to sell porn online. It made it harder for people to legally do all kinds of sex work, even kinds that weren't explicitly criminalized. 
For full service sex workers, though, the risks were most stark and a damage to people's incomes and people's lives was most notable. This is because it made it harder for sex workers to advertise online, which is a huge harm reduction measure. When you can't advertise online, people end up mostly doing street sex work, which has so many more risks because it's harder to screen, harder to blacklist, harder to decide where you're going, just harder to make informed choices about how you're selling sex and who you're selling sex to. For this reason, you know, it's another example of the criminalization of harm reduction and just this huge obvious overlap with this proposed abortion land legislation, which would criminalize the practices people who have abortions and the people who love them use to keep each other safe. Another example here, some more common frames to just highlight all the similarities between this. Let me, sorry, I had to adjust. Oh man, where am I? Okay, sorry about that. Some common frames used by opponents of abortion, opponents of sex work, opponents of transition, and opponents of harm reduction when it comes to drug use. There's this narrative from the right wing. I'll first of all explain my picture. This is from the New York Post. It's this really over the top, ridiculous right wing newspaper in New York. It's, you know, it's New York, so it's sold all across the country, but it's really well known for being a just extreme over the top and yet also kind of ubiquitous right wing themes that show up in regular politics as well. You know, these are kind of funny examples, but just looking at the frames. The first one, taxpayer money and deservingness. With abortion, we see this with the Hyde Amendment and with all of the panic about federal dollars going to Planned Parenthood. People have this idea, very common in the US, that people who spend more taxes deserve to have more say in their government. This idea that our taxpayer money shouldn't be going for bad things, it should only be going to good things, and that you shouldn't have to pay for someone else's health care if you don't approve of it. This is why the Hyde Amendment, which banned Medicaid funding or any federal funding for abortion, passed so much earlier before any repeal of Roe versus Wade was looking likely or was leaked. Similarly, this bans on federal, not bans, but every few budget cycles, there are these discussions of federal funding of Planned Parenthood, where people would talk about Planned Parenthood does abortions, we shouldn't be spending money on abortions, even though the Hyde Amendment already made it so that wasn't the case. And then, you know, we'd have to have these arguments about actually Planned Parenthood does pap smears, et cetera, as if abortions aren't healthcare, as if people don't have a right to healthcare, as if anyone who's receiving Medicaid because they're poor shouldn't be able to receive free healthcare, as if people in general shouldn't be able to receive free healthcare, including abortions. This idea of people who don't deserve something getting something shows up in this you know, when the COVID restriction, when COVID restrictions made it so that restrictions on methadone were loosened, some clinics in NYC were delivering methadone to people's doors. So you get this panicked headline of NYC delivering methadone to addicts, which is a, you know, unkind stigmatizing word with coronavirus as if, as if people who are dependent on drugs shouldn't have methadone, as if they should have to suffer On a different level, but doing a lot of the same work, we've got these ideas about abortion regret. They've got these narratives that, you know, abortion will make you infertile, which isn't true, which is very similar to these narratives that puberty blockers or hormones will always make you infertile, which is also not true. And ignores that people, including children, can give informed consent to hormones, knowing that there are risks to fertility, knowing that changes might happen that they don't support, knowing that, you know, People make decisions in their healthcare all the time. They get knee surgeries, they get elective surgeries of all kinds that they could potentially regret later on. People's moral judgments get involved. These panics about regret and about future fertility have been used to support laws like mandatory wait periods, which make it so that people who are pregnant have to wait 24, 48, even 72 hours between talking to a doctor to getting an abortion, and also ultrasound laws, which make it so you have to look at a fetus on an ultrasound as if people aren't capable of making decisions without that. You can see that, again, kind of over the top, but real example where New York Post is like, I literally lost organs. Why do transition teens regret changing genders? You know, it's, I don't know. It speaks for itself, honestly. 
The last thing, which we've been seeing so much of with drag queen story hours, with transition, but which we see here with the sex work is not a bad term, says book for high schoolers, is this moral panic about grooming. This idea that queer people, that people who facilitate abortions, that anyone who wants to reduce harm for sex workers must be grooming people, must be forcing people, must be sexually abusing young people. This leads to laws like parental consent laws, which say that parents have to sign off for someone to be able to have an abortion. Obviously, this puts people in more danger. If you have abusive or unsupportive parents and you have to tell them that you're pregnant in order to get an abortion, it'll be harder to get an abortion and you could be in danger. There have been, this was about 10 years ago, but there were these right-wing stings of Planned Parenthood clinics, which I think about a lot when I'm talking about this rumor narrative about transition. What they did was this group, I think live action, they came in and they pretended to be a, a girl pretended to be a victim of child sex trafficking. And then they had a man who was pre pretending to be an abusive manager, a pimp. They highly edited the footage, you know, but basically what they were asking is, can this actor who's being seen as a sex trafficking victim get an abortion? And the fact that Planned Parenthood was like, yes, you can still get an abortion was used as proof that they were facilitating trafficking, that abortions were being used to cover up abuse. When of course, while nobody should be coerced into abortion, while nobody should be forced into anything, people who are experiencing violence, including sex trafficking, also deserve bodily autonomy. Restricting someone from getting an abortion because they might be a victim is just victimizing them further. A lot of bad things there, so many bad things. I feel like awful thinking about all that. Luckily, there are some good parts, I swear to God. <laughs> by recognizing our common struggles, by talking about all this bad shit that we're all dealing with, by thinking about all the ways we're struggling together and suffering together, we can open up new avenues for solidarity. We can realize that our struggles are connected and that we have to fight together rather than throwing each other under the bus. Some examples of possibilities in the future, which I'll go into more detail as I keep on talking, are really leaning into harm reduction, really learning from sex workers and drug users movements. I'll talk a little bit about the history of harm reduction as I go, show you a little bit of video about harm reduction organizing. This is what I've been doing for the last few years. And as abortion and trans healthcare face more criminalization, we're gonna have to do more harm reduction work to keep each other safe. Secondly, Healthcare organizing opens up opportunities for reducing criminalization and reducing harm. We can organize as patients and we can also organize as healthcare workers in order to fight back against the criminalization of healthcare, fight back against the intrusion of the carceral state into our health services, into the healthcare services we offer as workers, and just fight for health justice for everybody. Lastly, all the commonalities here open up lines for us to re reject respectability politics. We have to understand our struggles are connected. There's no one who's undeserving and there's nobody who's too messy to fight for. I have a definition of harm reduction on screen. I won't read it out loud, but the basics here are that harm reduction tries to reduce the harms of drug use, but also reduces the harms of drug criminalization. We've got some examples of harm reduction on the screen and includes syringe exchange, naloxone, bike helmets, methadone, safety belts, sunscreen. The point this is trying to make is that Drug use, like most activities in life, has a lot of risks, has a lot of potential dangers, has a lot of harms. People can still make informed decisions about drug use and people shouldn't have to be criminalized or shouldn't have to be forced to abstain from drug use in order to receive healthcare and or to receive services and in order to use as safely and as healthily for them as possible. Health, harm reduction focuses on any positive change. It doesn't require that people stop using drugs in order to get support. There are all sorts of practices of harm reduction and most of them were founded by drug users. Most of them were founded at a time when syringe exchanges were still illegal, when naloxone was not provided by governments. This was done as direct action in order to support each other and keep each other alive during times with intense criminalization and times like now where we're losing so many people to the overdose crises all over the country and all over the world, unfortunately. I organize with the Urban Survivors Union, which as I mentioned, is an organization of people who use drugs in the United States. They did something a few years ago called the Narcofeminism Story Share, which was women and non-binary people who 
use drugs and or trade sex. I say and or, and I also don't say who are sex workers or who use drugs because so many people who use drugs and so many people in general trade sex without identifying as sex workers. If you go to someone's house, if you, you know, meet someone on Grindr and they're like, hey, I'll smoke you up if you come over and they smoke you up and you have sex, under the law, you've traded sex for drugs. There have been prostitution stings for that exact encounter, which happens to so many people every day, you know, just as a normal part of life. There are all sorts of degrees of choice, circumstance, and coercion for why people who use drugs or anyone might trade sex, but not all of them are professionalized sex work. The other principles of reproductive harm reduction mentioned are that the family regulation system is all these things, racist, anti-working class, ableist, and is traumatic. It's this idea that parents need resources to survive, including drug using parents, including parents who trade sex. The resource they need might vary. They might need drug treatment, harm reduction services. They might need childcare. They might need more family support. They might, they might need all kinds of things. What they don't ever need is being criminalized, being punished. Putting a kid in the foster care system doesn't help the parents use drugs in a more safe way, take care of their kids more effectively, and it doesn't help the kid experience less trauma, unfortunately. So the premise of this is that, you know, I'm gonna pause because I don't actually wanna keep talking about the premise. I wanna show you a little bit of this video story share. Thanks for bearing with me. Let me get to the right part because we're not watching this whole thing, although this whole thing is great to watch. Um, we can disrupt these narratives. Hi, I'm Tina. I'm Abby. And I'm Louise. I'm Katie. And I'm Dinah. So, welcome to Narco Feminism. We are working with women around the world to talk about issues related to substance use and women's health and women's lives and our dignity and and all of the different ways where substance use impacts our stories. Um, many, of us, many of us have never heard our stories told. Many of us have tried to make sense of our lives in the kinds of ways where we say things like it's a good thing they took my child or so good I went to jail. That was a good experience. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I believe, and I think, you know, those of us that have been working with this project believe that that's just us trying to make sense of things. That's just us trying to figure out, you know, things like, well, maybe some time and space helped. It didn't have to be dehumanizing and animalistic and all of these other things. But we started out just talking about the issues that we as women who use drugs and we say women with the X in it. So this is women, non-men. What are the issues that are important to us? We've covered so many points in our narco-feminism story share project, and we've gone into so many topics and have a lot of nuanced analysis. But I think we have three overarching points that we want to make today. Um, and the first one is just the sheer importance of being able to identify with a narrative. We see media and we don't see ourselves represented. We see women who use drugs demonized. We see our, our lives misinterpreted, distorted. We never get to hear a story, see ourselves on screen and think that's me, that's my experience. The second point that we really wanted to emphasize today is uh, the intersectional analysis that we bring to this. We bring different uh, degrees of privilege to the table doing this work. And when some, while some of us might suffer to some degree from criminalization and stigma, those of us who have more intersectional challenges, who are people of color, who are uh, low income, who are you know uh, more marginalized genders, all of us, those of us suffer much more. And the last thing that we wanted to cover today is somewhat segues from that second point, which is the respectability politics around drug use um, and which drug use is appropriate and which uh, puts that red A on your chest for addiction. And you know we have all of these trends and memes around wine moms. You know these wine moms would never think of themselves as you know parenting people who use drugs, and yet that's exactly what they are. But we know that the parenting people who use drugs that are truly pillorated, who are separated from their families, who get convicted under fetal assault laws, 
those are us, those are people who are more low income, more marginalized, using more criminalized drugs. Before we get started, can we just have a moment of silence for all of the women? Uh, we know we have women um, currently. We are not actually gonna do a moment of silence. Sorry to Louise from the video, um, who I do organize with. But um, let me get back to this video, um, this slideshow rather. Bit of a pivot, but also not that much because you know drug user unionism is a form of organizing and of unionism. Some people who, as I alluded to earlier, have a lot more power to resist criminalization of healthcare is healthcare workers themselves. As I mentioned with the Texas laws, mandatory reporting laws, while legally mandatory, are enforced by individuals, are enforced by people who can you know, discern for themselves how much they're willing to use the law against a child. Healthcare workers are in a unique position to refuse to enforce unjust laws, but they risk criminalization or firing in doing so. For a lot of people, this is a risk they're willing to take. For a lot of people, it might not be, but there are ways that we can make it easier to make these decisions. In particular, unionism, labor unions that are willing to stand up for workers who are criminalized, workers who are fired for not enforcing these unjust laws can help their patients and can help the workers as well. A lot of unions that exist, <laughs> I'm trying to not be mean. A lot of unions that exist are not fully prepared to do that yet, but unions are made up of workers. Unions are democratic institutions and workers have the power to organize within their unions in order to make them stronger, in order to make them defend patients and workers with the actual challenges we face, not just you know administering benefits. Another example of organizing that doesn't just exist in the workplace is ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and drug user unionism, like what we talked about with USU. These organizations, for since the AIDS epidemic and before that, have been facing stigma and criminal. ACT UP, AIDS academic, drug user unions have a long history. They've, you know, been facing down stigma, been facing down criminalization, been facing down ignorance of healthcare professionals, government denial, government criminalization and you know enforcement of discriminatory laws have made so many wins. Needle exchanges as legal things, as institutional things, were created by drug users resisting laws that made it illegal to carry around drug paraphernalia, to trade drug paraphernalia. The inclusion of women in HIV AIDS drug trials was fought for by ACT UP. For a while, it drugs for HIV were just not tested on women at all. And organizations like ACT UP, like the Lesbian Avengers, pointed out that it's not true that women can't get HIV. It's not true that women don't die of complications related to AIDS and that we needed equity in this testing. Similarly, the FDA approval process was restructured because of organizing by ACT UP, because of die-ins, because of people chaining themselves to government buildings, because of really intense direct action and because of research done by lay people, done by healthcare professionals, looking at potential treatments and saying, we need these approved faster. We need better ways to get drugs approved that don't make people wait years when there's a pandemic on. This has been very useful in the COVID-19 pandemic, has helped vaccines and drugs get approved in ways that weren't the case before ACT UP. So it's very much still relevant today and ACT UP still exists today. They're still fighting for the rights of people with HIV. They're still fighting for access to PrEP. They're fighting for harm reduction for drug use. All kinds of fights, all kinds of wins. Lastly, community-driven research, like that being done by ACT UP and like that being done in drug users unions, is research done by people who are directly affected by criminalization, who use drugs, who trade sex, by trans people, by people who've had abortions, by anyone who is affected by an issue and yet is excluded from places where decisions are made, where research is made about this issue. In that way, it's able to prioritize specific health needs, the on the ground needs of communities, not just what funders want, not what governments or institutions want. Lastly, more than anything, I wanna emphasize rejecting respectability politics. Respectability politics was a term coined by Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbottom in her book about the black church and the civil rights movement. There are purposes for respectability politics. If you're going to court and you need to defend yourself, if you need a lawyer to defend you, you might want to wear perils or a suit jacket and not, you know, a 
glittery lame onesie. <laughs> if you're going to go talk to a congressperson as a lobbyist, if you're going to go see a doctor and try to advocate for yourself in a healthcare setting, making yourself respectable makes sense to get your needs met. But when our social movements are predicated on respectability, on looking appropriate, on looking like we deserve good things, like we deserve to not suffer, there's already somebody who's less respectable than you are. There's always someone you're throwing under the bus. An example of this that I see a lot in abortion advocacy is when we try to bust stereotypes about abortion by saying, most people who've had abortions already had a kid. Plenty of you know, middle-class married people have abortions. That's all true. It's important to say that anyone can have an abortion. At the same time, abortion is healthcare and people deserve it, even if they're being irresponsible, even if they're having sex outside marriage, you know, air quotes around irresponsible, of course, even if they're having unprotected sex, even if they've had sex with clients that resulted in a pregnancy, even if they had sex where they were too high to remember to use their birth control as they intended to. And certainly even if they're not a cis person. Often, you know, movements, like many parts of the abortion rights movement will say, we need to focus on narratives that can win. We need to not focus on these specific narratives that you know, only affect certain people or that make us look too niche. But this has effects on people's actual health care. When abortion providers carry respectability politics attitudes, for example, and they're providing abortion or any kind of sexual health care to somebody who trades sex or use drugs, judgment, moralizing, and even reporting, even anti-trafficking reporting, even, you know, reporting of people if they already have kids and use drugs can get in the way of the health care that people are requiring. When we move away from respectability politics, my hope is that we can move towards a politics of solidarity. This is not just charity. This is not just, oh, we should take care of people who are suffering more than us. It's not even, oh, we have things in common, so I like you and we should get along and fight together. This is a tactical necessity because as I said before, it looks like abortion and medical transition in some capacity are going to be criminalized. When that happens, at least in parts of the country, at least some people, people who have abortions or who medically transition or who are gender nonconforming or who do drag will be in the same boat as people criminalized for using drugs and for trading sex. These are people that have been criminalized for a very long time. These are communities that have been criminalized for a very long time and have created harm reduction strategies and resistance strategies to cope with criminalization, to survive, and to build supportive community. I say this not to imply that these are separate communities. Trans people are more likely to trade sex. Trans people are more likely to use drugs. Trans people have abortions. All of these struggles already overlap in people's everyday lives. This is another reason why we cannot treat these like single issue struggles. We can't say, oh, I got to deal with my thing first. So, you know, we'll just deal with your stuff later. We have to be in this together and we have to learn from each other. I got stressed when I was putting the slide together. So I thought I'd put 